All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again to the Lubar Center, Eckstein Hall at Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers and people who are doing interesting and important work in this region and beyond. Today, we are joined by Dale Orlander Smith. She is an acclaimed performer, playwright, and poet. Um, she has been awarded numerous uh, honors during the course of her career. <laughs> the technology we love. <laughs> we love that. It's important. You'll see why in a, in a couple minutes. Uh, anyhow, she's an, an award-winning performer. Uh, she was a Pulitzer Prize for drama finalist back in 2002 uh, for her performance and for the play uh, Yellow Man. Uh, she is in Milwaukee right now uh, to perform in the Milwaukee Reps production of Until the Flood. This is a one-woman play that, that Dale wrote. Uh, in the aftermath of what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, 18-year-old Michael Brown uh, shot to death by a police officer, Darren Wilson. The uh, production, the play, explores the reactions of people in the St. Louis area to what happened. And we thought we'd begin today, because I know some of you have seen the play, some of you may have not seen the play. So we're going to begin with a video montage, which will give you some sense of, uh, of what we're going to be talking about in the next hour. So, Look at your screens on the left and the right. The name of the play is Until the Flood. Brian, you can roll the tape. Every night, I see their eyes, hear their voices, dark, frightened, boys, men. I didn't know Michael Brown or Mike, Mike as he calls him. He graduated high school, was about to enter college in the fall. Every day, I see that memorial spot, and I think, that could have been me. A mad, angry, and mad place, you feel me? And my anger is fluid. What made him do that? Who made him do that? It's not about America. It's about being fair. I was not there when Darren Wilson used his gun. He doesn't know. I don't know. Would you like to pray? Not in a mushy way, but in a human way. I pray for both of these young men. Some people got mad. But that's how my God speaks to me. Hmm. Won't you please welcome Dale Orlander Smith to Marquette Law School. So you started lunch without me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so I got to tell you, my wife and I saw uh, the play on Sunday night. Right. Uh, congratulations. Thank Powerful. You. Thank you so much. Uh, intense. We talked about it most of the rest of the night. We still still are talking about it days later. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure that's something you wish, wish people would do, is to talk about. Yes. Play. Yeah. I mean, listen, would I... You, huh? couple of things about the play. The way this is written, I'm performing it as a one-hander, but it's written where it could be multi-character, single character, anybody of any race and or gender can do it because it affects all of us. And the second thing is I talk to people. I do not talk for them. I don't have the right to speak for anyone. Mm. You know, so that's kind of like, because I kind of, you know, yeah, as a writer, yeah, you know, you have to set a boundary. Yeah. All right. So yeah. I want to talk about how this play came to be. Who approached you, or did you have the idea? How did this happen? St. Louis Repertory Theater came to me about it, because again, there's a thing, for those of you, who, who here is from Missouri? Anybody from Missouri? Mm -hmm. Okay, did you ever hear that expression, Ferguson fever? Ferguson fatigue, rather. Um, what it is, is they came to me because they said they got tired of Ferguson being referred to as the place where people get quote unquote killed, A, B. Um, they also wanted to invoke and provoke some conversation, and theater is a good way, I guess, to do that. So Seth Gordon, who I knew from New York, you can tell him from New York, right? You can tell him from New York, right? Uh, came to me and said, would you be willing to interview people within the community and talk about, and, and, and write a piece about this? So thus until the flood. So I, within three days, I interviewed about, gee, man, about 80 people. And you know, just got a sense of the community. Because what I did with the piece is, some of you saw it, some of you didn't see it, was we don't know the quote unquote truth. There are definite truths. 
The truth is, is that Ferguson is definitely racially divided. Within the history of Ferguson, there were no black policemen at all. And you had it where it was separated like into enclaves. Where say, I mean, I, I, can't, I don't know, I don't, uh, the, I can't tell you about like how the, this city is set up. But say this, this part of town has one mayor. Then you go where, where Milwaukee Rep is, that becomes another city and another mayor. Then you go to Bayview, that becomes another city and another mayor. So, that, so to keep the racial divide going, that's precisely what happened. So you've got that definite racial divide and the fact that black men within, between, 19, that was between 2015 and 2018, uh, 20, 20, I'm sorry, between seven, 2017, there were 120 black men pulled over and fined, also beaten. So you've got that actual racial divide, actual out and out racism. And then you've got the stories of Darren Wilson and of Michael Brown. That, that's, it's, it's all it's together and it's separate. And those bo then both of them are the flip side of the same coin in many ways, and I'll explain that later. I, I want to talk to you about the, the uh, conversations you had with people in mm -hmm. the St. Louis area. You said you talked about 80 people. I would guess those, were those conversations difficult? Were, you, did, you basically were there to listen. That's what I did. I would, throw out a, I would throw out a question and then listen. Because one of the hardest things, with every character in the piece, and this is my job as a theater worker, because I'm a theater worker, not a politician, I'm a theater worker, is to listen to people, even if I don't agree with them, I have to love them and understand them, otherwise they will become caricatures. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a couple of people I could not stand, they did not know that though. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I would like throw out a question and let them, you know, and let it rip and let them say what they had to say. You are an actor after all. You can Yeah, you can, but, 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 but also as a writer, for those of you who are in yes. journalism, for those of you, you know, studying law, whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, for those of you, you know, you have to, I'm sure there are people who, who among you who are lawyers, you're gonna rep people that you can't stand, but you still have to do your job anyway. Right? So I have to do that same thing as, as a theater worker. So after you listen uh, and you spend this time listening, what do you do, what did you do with what you learned? Describe the process for us of putting together the play after you have the conversations. I thought, because I, I still have to think dramatically. You know, there has to be a hard, there definitely has to be the reality of truth, mm -hmm. but there also is a theatrical truth. What will work on a stage and on a page? So what were the strongest voices to me? Um, and that's what I, what, what I kind of went by that, what I thought was the strongest, what I thought was, can invoke and provoke something, yeah? And you put together eight composite eight com characters. Eight composite characters, and I made, when I sat down with people, I made it very clear, I don't have the right to play you. I wanted to get a sense of what the feel was, you know, in this terrain, and then take it from there. But for me to play you, invade your life like that, I don't have the right to do that. There's a great, documentarian, her name is Anna DeVere Smith, who did a play called Twilight. She does that and she does it well. I don't do that. I mean, I'm, I'm primarily a play, playwright. So I made it very clear that these are composite figures. I gotta ask you, how did, when you told people who you were, why you were there, what was the reaction? Were they willing to share their, their innermost feelings with you? Yes, they, I mean, a lot of people did want to talk about this. Interesting. A couple of things happened. A lot of people wanted to talk about it. Other people use it as a means to bring attention to themselves. Um, and you know, uh, there were people jumping on a bandwagon. There were a few people that were hesitant. It's like, okay, here we go again. They were totally closed down. But the majority of people, in fact, were very, very willing to talk about this. This, uh, we were talking upstairs before we came down uh, to do this event. Uh, the subject matter, uh, this uh, uh, for historical purposes here, happened on August 9th, 2014. That's when mm -hmm. Michael Brown uh, was shot to death. Right. But here we are today in 2018, and we were talking upstairs what happened in Sacramento. Yes, yeah, Stefan, Stefan Clark, which just happened, what, the day before yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Shot 20 times. 20 times. And armed with a cell phone. Yeah. 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 What'd you say? In his own yard. In his own yard, yes. Yeah, well, same thing, because he was living there, yeah. And he was holding a cell phone. I know, I know, I know. So, so let's give people, again, some people in this room have, have seen the, the production, some have not. Um, 
I want to walk through a few of the characters. Okay. Um, and I want to begin with how you began, with Louisa, correct? Mm -hmm. This is a, uh, for background, this is a, a woman, African-American woman who's in her 70s, uh, retired school teacher, mm -hmm. uh, once lived out in New York, was a bit of a student activist in New York, but mm -hmm. returned uh, to the place that uh, she had grown up in. Mm -hmm. um, I want to show you the, the video of Louisa, or Dale as Louisa. I do want to mention before we show it, though, it does use the N-word, but I want people to be aware of that before mm -hmm. we show it. Mm -hmm. So let's show the video. The word that comes to mind is legacy. The legacy of self-hate. The legacy of keeping your place. The legacy of bowing and grinning. The legacy of seeing yourself as a nigga. Being taught to see yourself as a nigga. My God, how I hate that word. How I hate when anyone uses it, white or black. That young man, Michael Brown, was made to see himself that way as a nigger, as non-deserving. He was set up and set himself up to fail, to steal Tipperillo's of all things. He graduated high school, was about to enter college in the fall. What made him do that? Who made him do that? I'm angry at him. I'm angry in general. Something you heard, a familiar refrain? Yeah, um, where I think what happens is this, and I'm gonna say something that a few of you will get mad at, but that's okay. Everybody in this room is a racist. Everybody in this room is a racist. When we get angry, we resort, when somebody makes us mad, we don't call them a so-and-so-and-so. We will reach for whatever is sexist and or racist to, to make us angry. And in her individual case, she's, again, a composite figure. This is someone who I came across who was very influenced by Dr. King and who felt that in certain ways, I do think she's right, if, especially if you're looking at the sign of the times right now, where we've gone back. And how do you, you know, we've gone back to the 60s. It's like, how do we, you know... Uh, how do you wrestle with this? How do you not despise an entire group of people when something like this happens? So she's wrestling. So this is somebody I came across who was really wrestling with her own faith, wrestling with God, wrestling with herself. Anger was one of the uh, things she talked about. But mm -hmm. my, I would say, when I watched you perform that, I would say the other thing that jumped out of me was weariness. A weariness. There is a weariness. In, in 2018, we're still talking about these things. Yeah, we're still talking about this. That's exactly, that's, that's a good way to, yeah, yeah. One of the things that, that I think, and, and you touched on this earlier, Dale, one of the things that I think is so valuable about this play is that it is different perspectives. There are eight composite characters, five are African-American, three are white. Um, one of the, the white characters in this is a gentleman named Rusty. Mm -hmm. uh, you put on a Cardinal's jacket. I should say that the costume changes are fairly limited in this. That's right. Intentionally so. Yeah, who has time for a woman? <laughs> <laughs> but she becomes good. rusty. So yeah. this, is, this is a retired cop, and he's wearing a Cardinal's jacket. And he and his son have been talking about mm -hmm. what happened to Michael mm -hmm. Brown. And I think you say he wants to believe that the police officer acted in the right way. Is okay, that fair? We'll, 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 let, we'll, we'll explain the clip and then, yeah. okay, yeah, all right, go ahead, Ryan. I search my soul. I search my soul all the time. Sometimes I can get lost in the past, drink a little, too much whiskey. I'm the first one to tell you that. I want the feeling to just flow away, wash away. I do feel for Michael Brown and his family. I feel to Darren Wilson. My son may not believe it, but I do feel. I was not there when Darren Wilson, my brother, used his gun, felt like he had to use his gun. I wasn't there. My son wasn't there. Neither one of us was there. We don't know. He doesn't know. I don't know. We don't know. We just don't know. We got to go with the time. You gotta go with the flow. You just gotta go with the flow. The role of a policeman 
or any of you who've like been in the armed forces or anything like that, is um, I think to a certain degree when you talk to cops, they will say to you, this person who I'm next to is my brother, is my sister, I have to do that. There's, so you've got the confines of the law to a certain degree. You've got, and you've got the right of the law, and then you know, how do you maneuver that? There's, there's Rusty who really does feel, because he's struggling with it too. Um, there, is a, there is a law for the Army there is a, and, and the Navy and all of that stuff. There is a law for policemen. How do you talk to people? People, I mean, because again, looking at the opposite end of that, everything can come at a cop within that moment. I'm not justifying the killing of anybody, but policemen also have to act on a certain level that the rest of us don't. Having said that, this, you know, because you, you can't see all of this within this character, he is wrestling, he was, he's wrestling with his own sense of what he feels to be good, what he feels to be honest, who's right, who's wrong. Um, there are good cops, there are bad cops, this is what this man is saying. And he's saying, of course, someone who picks up, uh, who's, who, who's in this line of work, they have to be, they have to have a, a, a sense of rightness, but in times of fear, they don't. So it's really complicated because, again, for lack of a better term, these characters are not just simply black or white. The word that you use, haunted uh, or weary, they're all questioning themselves. The Michael Brown case, my, my, my approach to it as a writer definitely was to look at how people, how we were, how you get a slice of life, speak to, uh, to not for, about where we are uh, in, well, now 2018. But also, how do people wrestle with themselves? How do we live on a day-to-day -day basis knowing that this kind of stuff is going on? How do we look at the racist within us? How do we look at what's right within us? So that's, that's what my attitude in terms of writing it was. When you so that's what all these, all these characters are doing that very thing. They're trying to stay above board. How, does it, how, how, how do they wrestle this on a day-to-day -day basis? And when I sat down with certain people, there were people who just didn't know. They said, I don't, I don't know what to do with this. I was going to ask you uh, whether or not the way people viewed what happened yeah. broke down along racial lines, or were many people, as you just described, many people still wrestling with this? They just did simply it's didn't. all the above. It's racial yeah. lines. It's also their own individual, their own individualism. How do, how do they function within the world? You know, for those people who grew up in the '60s and the '70s, they were questioning: Did we do everything? Was it in vain? And also, again, I'm looking at my own hatred as someone who was so vehemently against race, and vehemently against you know, saying that we should all be together, I now don't know whether this is true anymore. And I've actually had people say that to me. I want to ask you about uh, the conversations you had with people who said things that, as you hinted at earlier, you, you did not agree with, or perhaps you didn't care for the person. How many mm -hmm. people in your conversations were simply in your face racist in what they said to you? Um, None of them were, but, but there were a few that, it's the kind of thing where I, it's, it's, here we go. <laughs> You'll get a sense of what I mean, right? If I were to call this person a racist, they would say no. Right. I went to go see, what's, what's, the, what's the, out, the house next, what is it? Yeah. Huh? One house over. Okay, <laughs> this is what happened. This is the kind of racism that I, I came across. I went to go see One House Over a week and a half ago. And me and my director were at the play, right? And so an elderly white lady turned around and said to me, we have to take care of our blacks here in Milwaukee. I said, okay. So then like after the second, after the, after the play was over with, she said, I hope I didn't offend you. And I said, yeah, you did. I said, it's kind of like we have to take care of our household pet. I said, that's the way that came out. And so I said, you know, sometimes, and she goes, well, I didn't mean that. I said, well, you know, sometimes certain things are better left unsaid, you know. And so when I spoke with certain people, that's the kind of thing that came, you know. And then, but now what was interesting about that woman, here we go, there was a part of her that realized that maybe I went a step too far and questioned what she did, which was why she turned around and asked me that question, or maybe it's because I shot her such a nasty look that she didn't know. <laughs> what I was going to do to her, you know, but um, 
But having said that, it was that kind of thing. And also, one person, a black person had said to me, well, I hope you don't, quote unquote, defend them. And I said, it's not about defending, it's about telling a truth, many truths. Mm -hmm. So it was, the, so it was those, those two things that had happened. You have one character in, in the uh, play who is uh, uh, very open about his racism. Is it Doug Ray is the? Doug Ray is the character's name. Uh, interesting backstory to him from Appalachia and, and uh, or, or I never uh, met him. childhood. And there was a guy, Doug Ray came about like this. Um, I forgot the name of the restaurant I was in in Ferguson. I was sitting, meet with people, talk with them. And he had on like, you know, he had on the gear. He had on, you know, his army gear. And as I was interviewing people, he never spoke to me directly. He shot me such dirty looks and I shot him back. <laughs> And so someone said to me, well, this guy comes in all the time because he's from the South and he's looking for Southern food and dot, 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 dot. And he just kept shooting me these dirty looks. And I was asking, I said, who is this man? And they said, um, well, he was someone who's self-made and he owns like property and stuff. So I just kind of looked at him again, like I said, a composite figure. And I looked at him, I tried to figure out what he was. Now, again, it's easy to make him out to be a quote unquote typical redneck. The same way like with the black characters, people automatically assume that black people who come from a poor background are gonna uh, automatically go toward crime. That's not what we do. I mean, people are multifaceted. Doug Ray, we find out, is someone who also read Hemingway, he also reads, read F. Scott Fitzgerald. So again, because also was true of this and true of Michael Brown and Darren Wilson, and again, we'll talk, to, talk about this at some point, their backgrounds are so similar in certain ways. Because I also had to look at that as a playwright. You know, uh, Can I explain a little yeah, bit why please, that is? Please. Michael Brown's mother had him when she was 16. Her mother had her when she was 16. Darren Wilson's mother had him when she was 19. Uh, by the time he was, by the time she was 34, she was married three times. She used to run scams on people. What she would do is befriend people in this room, and you'd say, oh, I'm going on vacation. And she goes, okay, and she goes, I'll mind your house for you. You should mind your house for you. She would get into your computer and rob you. Michael Brown's mother, was someone who was going from place to place because in her book Shame the Truth and Tell uh, uh, Tell the Tell Shame the Truth and Tell the uh, was it Tell the uh, Shame the Dr Shame the Devil and Tell the Truth, a lot of stuff was left out of it. The fact is, from what I understand, and I'm prefacing with it, from what I understand, she was getting high and stuff. She and Michael Brown Sr. were getting high, and they were going from place to place to place. There wasn't a steady place to live, so. But my, and she had him, so Michael Brown Sr. was maybe 19, 20 when, she had, when he had him. So this kid is basically raising himself. Darren Wilson, by the time he turned 18, his, uh, the, his mother died. She died when she was 34. The last stepfather that he had said, well, look, you know, I have a son. You're almost 18. It's time for you to go. So you have the flip side of the same coin where the, both of these young men grew up in parentless rootless homes. They, they even born on the same sign. Darren Wilson is May 13th, 1986. My, uh, Michael Brown was born May 20th, 1996. So when I talk about in terms of writing, this ties in with Doug Ray. We are all affected by childhood. Everybody in this room is. The very, sometimes the very thing you don't like about your parents, you in fact can become. Or you can go like the opposite. Is, is Baron, was Darren Wilson so straight edged that he looked at his mother as an example of what not to do? Did he overreact? Michael Brown did the same thing. Did he, because he came from this background, did he feel that he could succumb to that very thing? Or here we go. His grandmother was primarily raising him in the Canfield apartments. And these are the things I'm thinking about as a writer, you know, because again, they have to be fully fleshed. There must have been a part of him that thought, because I interviewed Michael Brown Sr., there must have been a part of him that thought, okay, you've got a second wife now, you've got a second family, where were you when I needed you? You know, because his, his uh, Michael Brown C, C, uh, sibling, sibling, Michael Brown Jr.'s siblings, he, he was 19 when he had you know, new siblings. He's practically old enough to be their parents. So there's a part of him as a human being. So I think that both of these guys, 
when they encountered each other. No one knows what happened in the last moments. Some people say he ran away. Other people said he didn't. Uh, some people were told to change their testimony. There's so many things that are going on. But I looked at them as two hurting human beings. And then, you've, and then like I said, then you've got the whole history of Ferguson with its whole racial mm -hmm. dynamic. Does that, does that make sense of what I'm saying in terms of my approach to it? Because you have, you, I have to make them human. I never came across Darren Wilson. At some point, there were certain people I did not want to meet because, again, Leslie McFadden, who is, in fact, um, Michael Brown's mother, was in the news a lot. And at one point, here we go, this gives you an indication as to how he was raised. And, I, and when I say how he was raised, do not think for one moment I'm justifying why he was killed because there's no justification for that. Um, the grandmother and the mother were fighting over the fact that grandma was selling Michael Brown merchandise and did not give mom any money. So it gives you an insight as to how he was raised. So I have to look at that and go away. Speaking of, of uh, Michael Brown's mom and dad, as you mentioned, you did. I spoke with Michael Brown Sr. and yeah. his current wife. Yeah. And what did they say about how they feel about what happened to their son at this point? You said it was. It was interesting what they said is. The man that I met versus what, and again, I don't know, you know, uh, I didn't know him, obviously. The man that I met is haunted. The man that I met didn't say so, but I think, and my impression was, is that I wish I could have been a better parent. Mm -hmm. That's the look that he, that's, that, that's the way he looked to me. His current wife seems lovely. I did not meet Leslie McFadden because, again, I didn't want to bring any more attention to what, you know, Hillary Clinton was hanging out with her, you know, Oprah was hanging out with her. And, you know, and I'm not saying that to be, to be uh, flippant by any way, but it's, I didn't want to make it into a media frenzy. I mean, it was enough of a media frenzy, you know, because I know she's on tour with books and stuff like that, but, because again, so there's, the, there's so in a nutshell, yeah, there's the, the, the horrific, racial divide, then there's the story of these two men and how they were raised. Uh, one of the, the actually there were a couple of scenes that really stayed with, uh, stayed with me on, on Sunday night, and they both involve your portrayal of 17-year-olds. One of them is a young man named Hassan. Hassan. He's angry. Yeah. He's angry that police view him with suspicion. He's angry and he's sad because he wants a relationship with a father yeah. who's not in his life. Mm -hmm. The other 17-year-old mm -hmm. has big dreams and right. wants to go on to college. Right. And I want to show a clip of this because there are a couple of lines at the end of this that are so haunting uh, to me. Uh, Ryan, let's show, this is Paul, this is a 17-year-old young man who's thinking about college. Just one day, Grandfather gave me a ride. Home from school, and I'm carrying books, art books. Elizabeth Catholic, Leonardo da Vinci, Romare Bearden, white cop, cop comes up and I'm scared, I'm so scared. I thought I was gonna wet myself. I actually thought I was gonna wet myself. He comes up smiling, laughing over, chewing gum, says, where'd you get them books from, boy? And I said, to school. Got the books from school. And he said, well, how do I know you can steal them books? And I said, sir, I am not a thief. But if I were, do you really think I would risk my life and or jail over books? A book about Leonardo da Vinci? And he stood there, thinking. And I could tell he felt stupid, real stupid. He just stood there staring. I was so scared. Didn't know what he was going to do. And he drove off. Some dudes were hanging around. They saw what happened. They said, yo, Paul, you told that cop cop off real good. You know all right, baby. That made me cool with some people. They didn't want to hang with me, but I keep my distance. Every day, I see that memorial spot for Michael Brown. Every day, I see it. And I think, that could have been me. That could have been my blood flowing down this street. That could have been me. And I think I got one more year to get out, just one more year. Please, God, let me get out. Please, God, don't let that happen to me. Because see, also what happens is, is this. 
you know, uh, you got, because one thing, it was important to have Paul in there because, again, some people, hmm, this, this gets a little sticky, yeah? Obviously, this needs to be brought to attention, but there's, I've had, a, I've had a little static with certain people where they feel we have to, t the, the woman who said we have to take care of our blacks, somehow they're making, people like that who think that way are infantilizing. They're making it sound as if you know, black people don't have a choice, we're, we're intellectually inferior, we have to take care of you. I don't need you to take care of me. I don't need anybody, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's patronizing. Then you've got the characters like Paul who do have both parents who check his, their, their kids' homework. Someone who does study art, he doesn't have to necessarily be a football player or a basketball player. You know, we have brains, yeah? So you've got someone who wants to be a painter, who, who loves art. You rarely see that within the media. You, know, you, you rarely see the people that take care of their children, that you know, take care of their children's home, homework, and who don't have to necessarily resort to sports. You know, they can be, like any group of people, we're a melting pot within them. We're doctors, we're lawyers, we're politicians, we're a lot of different things, you know? So it's important that that character also be there. And I did come across kids who were doing the right thing, and he goes, no one ever really looks out for us. And one person did say to me, he goes, well, you know, you know, Michael Brown was a thug. I'm not saying that he deserved to be killed. He goes, but what about kids like my son who go to school, do what they have to do, who has a part-time job? No one looks at that population. So I said, that's, that's, an inter that's interesting to hear that because a lot of times that those, I mean, all of, you know, a lot of people get really, you know, get thrown under the bus and fall through the cracks. But we do rarely see within the media, you know, the black people that do take care of their kids and the kids that are, in fact, prompted and ready to take on life and do things, you know, so, yeah. What has been the reaction to the play when you performed it in St. Louis? Let's begin there. What was the reaction, the audience reaction Except to it? for two people, the reaction was strong because, again, there was one person that said, you know, you made all white people look bad, which I did not do. And then there was a black woman who said, well, you're saying, your character Louisa said that, you know, uh, that Michael Brown brought it upon himself. I said, that's not what I said. Because again, it's, like I said, it's not that black and white. It's much, it's much more complex than that. And I also realize that people are gonna get mad because they're gonna want their own sense of justice at the expense of someone else's truth. You know, so I have to do what I have to do as a, as, as a playwright and as, as an actor and as a human. You, um you do one uh, person performances often. Hey. I'm not crazy about it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, the reason why I do it is because, I mean, it's like it just so happens. Like, to me, it's all theater. Okay. You know, but like I said, this piece is like multi-character, single character. But also, if I didn't write, I wouldn't work because, you know, on a, on a physical level, I'm not, you know, America's version of eye candy or any of that stuff. <laughs> and it's like, um, you know, because it is. I mean, this business a lot of time is based upon looks and stuff. And it's, this, this generation is just beginning to change that a little bit. But if I, so I had to like write things for myself, otherwise I wouldn't be working. So I mean, it literally, so that's, that's, why, that's part of the reason why I do it. But I'm hoping that other people do do this play, and I'm also writing other things. So. You're gonna be taking this play to other places too? I go to the Goodman in Chicago right after this, and then I go back to New York for a hot second, then I go to ACT Seattle, and then I'm home for a while. No, not really. I got to do something else. And then I go to Portland Center Stage in 2019 with this one. Yeah. Uh, one of the things the rep is doing, if you go to the production here, uh, they have conversations afterwards uh, that you can participate in. You don't have to. If you want to, you can. So it's something you should be aware of if you, if you go see the production. I don't do it, though. It's so like you have to do it on your own. I don't participate. In it. I don't. Well, you, you got to be exhausted at the end of, yeah. of that program. I was going to say, because... All right, if you watch this, it's what, 70, 75 minutes in length or something like that? The, no. How long is it? How do you know? You saw it? I ushered. I ushered. Oh, you ushered, yeah? She said it's 65. 65? About right. Yeah, she's about right. Yeah. Oh, it's close. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she's going from character to character in mere seconds. Maybe when she throws a shawl on for part of it, or you throw on the Cardinal's jacket, or you sit down at a chair, but you are changing emotions, you're changing dialect, you're changing everything yeah. in mere seconds. That's right. got to be exhausting. It is. <laughs> it, 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 it is. How do you do it? I've been trained to do this. You know, I mean, I've been doing this a real long, you know, I'm 58, so I've been doing this a really long time, you know, so. 
What can I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a profound answer for you. <laughs> so I'll ask you a profound question then. Okay. <laughs> or maybe not so profound. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about how you ended up performing, being a playwright, being a poet. Where did that begin for you? In a weird way, you know, I used to like be, be self-congratulatory and say, I did it myself. But um, one thing I had to look at was, you know, I grew up in Harlem in the South Bronx, you know, in, in the 60s and the early 70s, which and then for people now who are relocating to New York, you know, Harlem is now the place to go. But at the time when I grew up there was not. And I looked at the, I worked on a piece before this called Forever, which was a memoir piece. And it starts and ends at Jim Morrison's grave in Père Lachaise in France. And I had to look at, can I put my foot up here? Yeah, absolutely. And it was glass, you know. <laughs> if it breaks, I'm not paying for it. <laughs> um, but, uh, but if it, um, and, I, and I was thinking about the books that were, as I wrote that piece, I realized that Charles Dickens was in my house. I realized that the James Baldwin was in my house. Ravel's Bolero was in my house. My mother. It was my mother that had all that stuff in the house. And I went, huh, OK. So that kind of introduced me to stuff. And for those of you who are like close to my age bracket, do you remember the movie of the week? There used to be like Paul Newman week. There used to be um, Sidney Poitier week. So watching that, and also as, and don't take offense, I'm a recovering Catholic, right? And the nuns took us to see a play. They had no idea what they were taking us to see. The first person that I saw on stage was James Earl Jones. I saw the great White Hope on stage. I went, what? <laughs> you know, so then after seeing that, it's like, I got to do this. I got to do this. And then Brando and people like that. So, you know, so, yeah, like watching Brando and Movie of the Week. And, you know, like, so that's, that's the thing. So, you know, Ravel's Bolero. And then also just seeing, I mean, that the great white hope actually literally altered my sentence, says the sentence. I'm also a, you know, a music fan, so like. You're a rock and roll fan. I'm a rock and roll. I listen to everything, but rock and roll is what I listen to. And like the first time I heard Light My Fire was by a singer called Jose Feliciano. Mm -hmm. Then, you laugh at me. You remember that. <laughs> and then I actually heard The Doors do it. And then after like listening to The Doors, The Doors opened me up to the French canon of poetry which was Rimbaud, Brulé, Comte de And then somehow reading, so Jim Morrison said something, and that led me to Toni Morrison reading The Bluest Eye. So I'm kind of all over the map, you know? Was Jim Morrison popular in the neighborhood where you grew Are up? Are you kidding? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. In terms of Jim, Jim Brown, James Brown, yeah, but not Jim Morrison. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, that's what James Brown was, not Jim Morrison, no. But I, I mean, I don't limit myself that way, because to me, right. it's all art, right? It's all work, so whatever, you know. You, you commented earlier about um, our parents, and, um, mm. and I got to talk to you a little bit more about that, because uh, in the play, we have the young man who longs for a dad who's not in his life. Right. We have the character, Doug Ray, the, the racist, who is passing that on to his son. But also, where did he get it from? From his parents. His father was an alcoholic, right? That abused him, right? The sins of our... The sins of the father, the sins of the mother. That's what happened. It's a recurring theme in, in work you've done. There's a book that helped me write this. I mean, I read this book every year called Drama of the Gifted Child by a woman called Alice Miller. And what she talks about is that all children are gifted. But what happens is, depending upon the kind of parent that you have, sometimes people um, romanticize themselves and they expect their children to be extensions of them. You know, they tend to glorify, when I was your age, I did so and so and so. When I was your age, I did such and such and such. And you're not looking at this person as being a person, yes, certainly you made this person, but this person is not here to fulfill you. They are an individual in and of themselves. So a lot of times we don't have respect for children. We don't. That horrible expression, children should be seen and not heard, that's an individual you're talking to. That's a person you're talking to. And we do terrible things to our and kids, And we do too. terrible things to our kids. We've been talking a lot about trauma in this community yeah. uh, in the last year or so. Yeah. Yeah. And see, also in terms, like I'm saying, in terms of writing all these people, I looked at, I imagined certain things about childhood. I imagine, you know, because I, I, tend to, I tend to work that way, you know, in terms of looking at, 
where a person comes from, how are they raised, how do they feel about themselves, how are they made to feel about themselves. Um, you know, yeah. Like, like, you know, like for instance, like, you know, because sometimes I teach writing, whether it be multi character or single character, and I'll say to somebody, let's say, I mean, no matter what, like, just the, the one person genre in theater, for instance, has been made into a confessional. It doesn't have to be. I mean, you can write about different kinds of things. Like, to me, it's all theater. But if someone writes in their, say, like, let's say if they're writing a, a, a memoir piece, I'll say, write a monologue in your mother's voice or your father's voice when they were eight years old and frightened. And they look at me like this. I said, because guess what? They were. Write a monologue in your own voice when you've hurt someone, when you have been hateful, cruel to someone, because you have. Everybody in this room has been cruel. Not just vulnerable, you've also been cruel. You've, everybody in this room has hurt people, we have. And that's what I mean by the human condition, yeah? You know, it has to be a... Speaking of the human condition, I, I watched the end of the play, and I, I, I want to have you talk a little bit about that. Are you hopeful about race relations? And I ask that, I'll, I'll put some context on it. So one of the things we do at this law school, as a lot of people in this room know, is we do public opinion polling. So back in October of last year, uh, we do a poll of southeastern Wisconsin. 1,200 people are polled. One of the questions we asked is, are race relations better today than they were 20 years ago, or are they worse than they were 20 years ago? 63% mm. said worse. I found that so discouraging. Are you hopeful? Are you optimistic that we're going to make progress, real progress? Yes. I, I, the reason why I hesitate also is because, like I said, within all, within all of us, there is a racist. And, I get, and again, it's just sometimes I'm somebody who hangs out with everybody. When I dated, I dated all kinds of men. I didn't care what the color was. But having said that, I do have my moments when I'm very angry. So I have to yank back and go, you know what? Yeah. But I, uh, but I am hopeful because that's what I mean, the three fingers pointing back at you. You know, I think we have to search ourselves before we speak, you know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We have to really dig into ourselves, but I, I am hopeful about it, yes. Yes. I'm going to take some audience questions, my final question for you. What, what's your next big project? You said you're doing something, a play that, Billy Holiday? This is what happened. If you can get to Chicago, that'd be nice. If you can't, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I have a play called Lady in Denmark, which is opening at, I'm not in it. It's, um, it's a one-hander that I wrote for someone else. And Billie Holiday's Lady Sings the Blues, which she worked with uh, William Dufty, who, used to, who was married to Gloria, the actress Gloria Swanson. A lot of it is really kind of funky the way it's written, because she was in need of money at the time. And you know her habit was big, and people were taking advantage. Uh, but what's true is her first tour of Europe was January 18th, 1954. That's the first time she went. And the first place she went to was Copenhagen. And she talked about how there was a family that was there, a doctor and his daughter, who was very, you know, who were very, they, they did very well during the war. You never, I mean, mostly when we hear about World War II, we hear about the Holocaust survivors, but you never hear about Scandinavia and other, other parts of the world. And they lost all their money. so. She goes to Copenhagen, she has this cough, she gigs somewhere, and the doctor said, listen, you know, come, I got something for you. And she's like, I don't know. And he goes, no, no, no. So he said to her, look, you are an addict, you are not a criminal. Come live with me and my family. We will take care of you. The way, that you, the way you're being treated as an addict, the way you're treating as, as, as a black person in the States, we will take, you know. So she said, no, no, and she said, but she kept in contact with him for a little while. So that story stayed with me. So I tried to find the family. I could not find the family. The woman would be, the, the daughter was, was 12 years old at the time. So that means she was born in 1942, so there's a good chance she's still alive. So I have an artistic associate relationship with the Goodman. And I told them the story. I said, I want to write this thing. And I want to write it as a one-hander. And they said, well, set it here in Chicago, because we have a large Scandinavian population in Chicago. So what I did was, I don't speak any Danish, so I was going online, things, you know, going back and forth and writing this thing. And so it's about a woman called Helene, who's a Danish-American, who has a party. She loses her husband like three weeks before who turns 80, but she still has this party. But we look at how that one meeting with Billie Holiday and how Billie Holiday's music set a course for her for her entire life. When she, someone, someone dies and when there's a party, she plays Billie Holiday when something 
when she's happy about something, she plays Billie Holiday. She thinks, so this is Fuss Lady in Denmark. That's the name of the piece. Sounds great. Sounds yeah. great. Let's take some questions from the audience. If you're in the seating bowl, press down on the button. It'll say push. Keep your finger pushing down on that button. We'll be able to hear your question. If you're, wow. in, the, if you're in the back, raise your hand. Ryan will walk over with a microphone and we'll uh, take your question. You know, technology is weird. <laughs> it's good. It's good. No, it's good. No, the reason why, because I mean, I'm the last of my kind. I don't even have a cell phone. <laughs> why is that so far fetched? I don't have one. <laughs> is that so far fetched? You know, because people say, I don't believe you have a cell phone. No, I mean, I have a landline and then I, have, I go online to check questions, but I don't have a cell phone. <laughs> I don't want a cell phone. I don't want one either, but. But you have to have one. <laughs> <laughs> have to have one. <laughs> or maybe I ask my dean, I don't need a cell, cell phone, phone, do I? Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Right. Anybody have a question? Well, this has got to be a first. Yeah, Marilise, go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Oh, this it is, okay. right? <laughs> uh, Marilise Hood. Uh, I serve at City of Milwaukee. Thank you for being here, first of all. Thank well, you thank you, and thank you all for you. Really appreciate it. Uh, I just, just listening to you, I am so struck by your ability to be empathetic, uh, your ability to really have such a high emotional intelligence for all stories, not just for a single side of the story. Mm. And um, I just want to know a little more. Could you unpack how you got there? How, how did you get to this place where you can be so empathetic and so extremely emotionally intelligent in, in wanting to learn so many sides of a story? What, what do you do? Well, you know, um, I mean, that's, that's, that's a very kind thing to say. I work at it constantly. It's constant work, you know, because again, as without getting too heavy, but it is heavy, I also look at the people on the planet in general that I've also hurt and how the way that's impacted people. You know, when people talk about this has been done, that has been done. You know, I've also been a very cruel person and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not proud of that person. So that's the thing that makes me look. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. By looking at yourself. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. Other questions? Raise your hand. Yes, sir. I thought it was great, and I thought you were great, and uh, oh, but I, uh, I really did. <laughs> it was, but I thought there was one uh, character that was missing from your menage. You Watch there. this guy. You gonna write the play for me? What's, what's missing? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll do my best. Uh, I didn't see a white liberal with any any strength in the. Play. You didn't. No, I didn't. You didn't. I, did I you see this one. play? I, I saw a play. So, well, why does, why does it have, again, this is what I mean when people have their own sense of justice at the expense of someone else's truth. I think Connie is. I thought, I thought not very strong, though. That was my, my feeling. Well, yeah, well, what can I tell you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the great thing about art. Yeah. We, you know, we perceive yeah. things differently. Yes, let's go back up here, Ryan. Yeah. You want to spend some more time and write a play about Milwaukee? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, I'm actually writing a play from Milwaukee rep about women and aging. Yeah. What'd you say? What'd you say? <laughs> That's my twin. <laughs> well, actually, you know, what happened in Ferguson, you know, things... There are a lot of similarities. To I know there are. It's not just Milwaukee. It's, I know, I know. You know this is, I'm getting ready to go to Chicago, which is also another right. volatile city, right? Right. Yeah. You had, yeah. Yeah. I don't know why I have so much difficulty with this. Um, I th thank you also for, you know, I, I, you're hearing it again, but thank you for being here. It's, it's really a different, um, your honesty and your candor and uh, is refreshing but necessary and one of the things that you said about media which has come up here in other conversations and so this question is actually a little directed to you and to mike um is what can we do to get i'm thinking about you talking about the stories of the african american homes where the parents are present and they're good parents and the child is excelling and mm -hmm. and going to grow up and go to college god forbid something happens to him or her violently that you know, he's he or she's not creating the circumstances. Anyway, the point is, is what, if anything, and I know this is outside the realm of a playwright and an actor, but what, if anything, can we do as a population, U.S. citizens, to get in the media, 
some of the things that lead us to a better place instead of all, we have to have the bad news. I mean, I know we do, okay? But, but to, to exactly what you're talking about, to get the media to reflect some of these stories that lead us to better behavior. I have no clue. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, I have no clue. But also, again, my question is also, too, it's like sometimes, like, even with the lady who, who said what she said to me, like, a week and a half ago, at what point do people acquaint themselves with the world or not acquaint themselves with the world? Because I think there's, I mean, I think the media does, it, definitely the media does play a role, but also you have a lot of people who just simply do not want to know. You know, th there are people who keep themselves ignorant. You know, I've heard people say, I walk with Dr. King, I don't, there's, what more do you want from me? I, I gave to such and such, what more do you want from me? You know, so a lot of times people simply, they shut down. So at what point is it the individual's responsibility, you know? I mean, there's, there's also that that comes into play, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's really, uh, yeah. You're not expecting me to answer that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't have anything profound to say about it, to borrow a word that I used earlier, but I, you know, the two things that, that in my career, I, I think I've always tried to do, and, and I think we as journalists should be trying to do this, is that we need to ask ourselves a series of questions when we cover stories. And we need to ask questions such as, what will be the impact on this community? What will be the impact on this neighborhood? Are we telling the entire truth? Are we just telling a piece of the story, but not the full story? Uh, one of the things that in my career has always sort of driven me a little bit nuts is that you know something bad will happen in a neighborhood, the media will cover it, um, and, uh, and that will represent to many people that neighborhood. Yeah. It's the only thing that happens in that neighborhood. That's all they know it for. That's troubling to me. So I, I, I think you know, that's something we have to ask ourselves. What, you know, is there more to this story than what we're telling? And, and how do we tell the whole story? Yeah. And the other thing I say is I, I do think that it's helpful uh, in media when you have people who've lived in a community for some time, who've invested in that community, who've put down roots in that community, whose kids go to school in that community. Yeah. I think that's a big deal because I think if you're just in, this is not a, a criticism of the nature of the business, but a lot of people are on to the next market. They're on to the next place. And, and to be honest, I think there's going to be less thought about what the impact of what you do is on a community. Yeah. So I, I think having more veteran staffs, having people who have roots in a place uh, makes a difference. Mm. So again, that's nothing terribly... Uh, no, it is. That's great. Let's take some other questions for, for Dale. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead. <laughs> um, I was, you know, through history, writers, uh, theater, all that kind of thing, has been a voice of, you know, for people what's going on. And if you've been in, um, you know, this work for a long time, do you, how do you see the art supported right now or your theater and writing? How do I see? So how do you see it supported by the public or, you know, with money? Um, do you see any big changes right now? It should be supported more. It really should be supported more. Or up and down as you've gone through time? I mean, I, I personally have been lucky, but overall, I mean, the fact that, you know, there's a friend of mine, he's real cool. He's a, he's a custodian, and custodians are necessary. Like, you know, everybody's job is necessary. He goes, but I think it's sick that I get $85,000 a week and you get, like sometimes depending upon what I'm working on, that you'll get like maybe 30 grand for the year. Mm -hmm. So that is, I, I, you know, but again, this is what I do. I can't do anything else, but I, I do think it should be supported more. You know, I do think that it's, it's a necessary food as well. Yeah. Other questions? I'll go here, yeah. Following up on what you just said and your question about what can the public do to get stories that are fuller, I think the answer, in part, is who we support by giving to the arts, by turning out for plays like this, and also subscribing to the local paper as much as my heart hurts about how it's changed here. We need to hear all the stories, and what the media want and need is eyeballs. 
so that they can sell them to the advertisers. So we need to be aware of our work as an audience in demanding and applauding what we think is But also, again, it's work as an individual, because a lot of times I'll hear people say, I don't want to see such and such. This is too depressing. Mm -hmm. This is what I mean by our own individual work as people. A lot of times people do, they thrust things away from them. You know, they don't, you know, at what point does the, indi you know, individuals form the collective, right? So how do we as an individual, how, do, how does this individual, this, you know, play into that? You know, change, you know, I mean, also within theater, you know, a lot of times people have to deal with their board members. And board members, we don't want to support this, we don't want to support that, that's too depressing. There's a friend of mine who, this, this doesn't happen so much now, but about 15 years ago, a friend of mine who's Muslim, you know, she happened to be, a, a lot of people on the board were Jewish, and I'm not saying, and again, I'm not saying this in an anti-Semitic way, but they were saying, we don't want to support this play because she's a Muslim. That's wrong. That's wrong. Yeah. Other questions? Let me go up there. Anybody else in the back? Go ahead. Hurry up, because you know what happened? I have to go to Whole Foods, and then I have a, a play that I have to do tonight. <laughs> So, <laughs> I like you guys, but you know. <laughs> um, I was very optimistic about race relations when Obama was elected. Mm -hmm. And then there was a backlash, and we're in the situation we're in now. Um, but I look at the younger generation, and I have some feeling of optimism again similar to what I felt in the 60s when I was their age. Um, and then that all went south because we're the ones, unfortunately, who created the situation now. Uh, do you have that same sense of optimism about our youth? Today? I mean, I was talking about that today. Well, this, this generation is doing stuff. I mean, the way they're questioning gender, the way, you know, we were talking, you know, I was in the car with Francis who brought me here. And like, for instance, like, you know, like size movement. It's like, you know, how the way people are, you know, what girls are celebrating, you know, different kinds of sizes and different kinds of beauty and all that kind of stuff, the impact that that has. I do think so. And what those kids are doing in Florida is amazing. You know, so I do think, I, you know, because history does, in fact, repeat itself, you know. And I think sometimes people deify their, you know, deify their time. But there will always be a group of people that rise up somehow. So, yeah, I am. I'm really enthused about what young people are doing. I'm really, you know. And actually, within the theater, when we talk about the problems of theater, there need to be more divor divor diverse voices. And there need to be younger writers getting done, you know. That's that, still a problem? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, ha it's changing a bit, but it still needs to happen more. So there, ne there needs to be more people of color, more younger people, more women in the theater, you know. Mm -hmm. LGBT, everything, all of it, all of the above. You know, it needs, it needs to be much more diverse than what it is. Because that, that's also problematic, too, because also, you know, theater, again, like I said, is also a, a soul food, as it were, a mental food. Yeah. Would you recommend what you do to others? Wait a it's minute. a tough life. Yeah, it is a tough life. I, I mean, it works for me, but it doesn't work for everybody. You know, it doesn't. It, it cannot work for. It won't work for everybody because it, it, it's very, very difficult. But you couldn't imagine doing anything else. I can't do anything else. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything. Else. <laughs> I'd be lousy at doing anything else. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to wrap things up. Uh, before we go, I want to say a couple of things. You, the performance goes through April 22nd, I believe. Is it? Am I, I have that right? Yeah, the 22nd. April 22nd. Um, on the weekends, there are two shows. On Saturday, it's... Four and eight. Man. <laughs> it's four and eight. And on Sunday, it's what? <laughs> you don't know. Two and seven. <laughs> two and seven. So we have, so now that we have that, if you don't have that committed to memory, um, there is a table outside. Uh, the rep is uh, uh, repping the table, and they'll, uh, they have some materials that if you want to pick them up, you can look at them. Kara, I think, is the person up there. She's seated in the back. And before we go, I also want to recognize a couple of people. I see one of the executive producers here, Jackie Hurt Barber. Is Connie Kordsmeyer in the room? Do I I'm missing her? Connie? John? Uh, some of the executive producers who have enabled this, this production to come to that's Milwaukee. That's Connie. Yeah. Connie there. That's John. That's John. And that's, yeah, that's Jackie back there. Jackie Barber, yeah. yeah. And I know you too. So having said that, uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, we always appreciate your, your time, your interest, and attention. And if you haven't seen it, 
Go check it out. Until a flood with Dale Orlander. And thank you so thank much you for much. coming. It's been a lot of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.